With kernel regression, we're interested in a different objective than in density estimation. Basically, the data we're interested in looks like this. We have an explanatory variable, and we have our outcome y. And then we're interested in backing out the relationship between the explanatory variable x and y. And, and you can see there's some noise around this true relationship. So whereas in the density estimation, we all know about histograms, there's an alternative simple to understand tool here called a binned scatter plot which does this, um, and I'm going to show you exactly how that works, which is kind of an equivalent of, um, of the histogram. It does, it's just averages within bins of x, so within uh, chunks of x. Let me show you how it works. Um, first, I simulate the data, and we have some, uh, some x and y variables. Oops, you can see that I'm misnaming this one. We're getting an error. There we go. I have my X and my Y, as you see in the slide. Then I choose to use uh, six bins here. And then let's have a look at how the script works. It chunks out the data uh, depending on the distribution of X. And then within each of these, it calculates the mean and assigns that here to a dot. So we're moving along the x-axis, uh, dividing it up into different uh, regions, and within these we calculate the mean of the y for the observations that fall into that region of y. And we assign that to that red dot. And then at the end of the whole thing, we connect them with a line. This is what's known as a binned scatter plot. Uh, it's implemented in Stata as what, uh, something called the bin scatter. And, and it's really quite simple what it does. You tell it uh, the number of bins you want. Let's say we want to use 20 now. Then it creates uh, this thing called PP, which uh, is the quant 21 quantiles of, uh, of the, the, the Z variable, the explanatory variable. As you can see, it goes from 0, 0 0.05 quantile, 0 0.1 quantile, and so on and it calculates all the quantiles of uh, z. Um, then we pre-allocate the two outcomes that we're going to be plotting against each other down here. And then for each of the bins, um, we find the data that belongs to that bin, so the data that has z greater than uh, pp of i and smaller than pp of i plus 1, so greater than, than the first here and smaller than the next um, bin, and then we calculate the mean of z and the mean of y in that, for those observations. Uh, so here it is with 20 points, we can see that it's getting finer, and if we use, say, 50 points, we can see that it's getting really fine, almost too fine. It moves too much up and down. We don't like that. We don't think that the true process looks like that. Um, or you might think that, but that will make your your life hard. In general, it's harder to estimate a model if, if, there's, uh, if the data can be that jittery. This one has way too little variation. That's just a linear uh, relationship, so that's perhaps too inflexible. And that's the sense in which there's a bias variance trade-off here, as well as in the density estimation. And here you have the, it, uh, this is called overfitting when we have too many bins, and this is underfitting when we have too few bins. So kernel regression is kind of an extension of this bin scatter plot in the same way that the uh, kernel density estimator was an extension of the histogram. The idea is to approximate the true function, let's call it age of x, with an average of y for those observations where xi is close to x. So whenever we want to evaluate age at some x, we find the observations that are close to x, the, x, the i for which xi is close to x, and calculate an average of y. Um, and then uh, there's a bandwidth which controls how quickly we remove the weight. So we use a weighted average of the y's and the weight is falling in the distance between xi and x. And this weight is called the bandwidth and again it balances the bias and the variance. Here we have uh, two versions of the kernel regression estimator 
uh, as you can see, the red one is, has a way too high bandwidth. It's underfitting. So there's a lot of bias in this region. It's systematically over. And in this region, it's systematically under the true line. And here you have this uh, golden line. And you can see that it has way too low bandwidth. It's overfitting the data. It almost goes through every single point, uh, which is not uh, what we want. That's fitting the noise in the data more than it's fitting uh, the underlying signal. So um, this is what the uh, kernel regression estimator looks like. It's an average over all the y's with weights on each of them. And these weights depend on x, the place where we are evaluating the kernel regression estimator, the Nadaraya Watson estimator, uh, in the sense that, first of all, they're going to sum to 1. That's why this denominator is constructed like this. And the numerator is constructed so that it puts higher weight on observations that are closer to the x where we're evaluating it. And the bandwidth then controls how quickly this weight changes as we move away from the x, the red x, where we're evaluating uh, this function. How do we choose this bandwidth? Um, the idea is to buy it, balance this bias variance trade-off that I've talked about. And one way of uh, doing that is using the jackknife cross-validation criterion. To do this, you have to take a, an average squared error is the criterion. So suppose you want to try out a bandwidth B, then you choose your, the cross-validation criterion is the average squared error where um, the error is the observed Y minus a prediction where in forming this prediction we've kicked out observation I. So in other words we're removing observation I and then estimating on the remaining sample. This is what the, cross, uh, the jackknife cross-validation criterion looks like you can see that it looks like an optimal bandwidth would be somewhere around 0.2 and this plug-in bandwidth Silverman is here so it's not too bad but it's not uh, super good either. It can take a while to evaluate a cross-validation criterion. Um, so let's look at a few uh, examples. I've added the, da the dotted line here, the dashed line is the true function that we're trying to estimate Here's the kernel regression with the optimal bandwidth. Here it is with an overfitted bandwidth. And as you can see, the, what the jackknife criterion will be punishing is that for this observation here, that looks like it's, if you remove that observation, the prediction point here would probably change a lot. And that's uh, one of the things that the jackknife criterion is, um, is meant to capture. Here's uh, an underfitted version. You can see it has, it's moving up but it doesn't have sufficient um, curvature to capture this movement, uh, this wavy movement that the true function that I've created has.